It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Andrew Jackson from uh, University College uh, uh, Dublin. Andrew is an environmental and planning lawyer with broad interests in these fields at international, EU and Irish levels. He has worked for the international law firm Slaughter and May in London and Paris and for the UK government's legal service in the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and with the NGOs, Friends of the Irish Environment and Antashka. And he has played a, a leading role um, in one of a number of interesting climate change uh, court cases, the uh, Irish uh, climate case, and uh, he's going to address us now about the launch of our network. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here at the launch of the Environmental Justice Network Ireland. Many thanks to Kira and Peter for inviting me to speak. It's particularly fitting, I think, that the network is being launched on this, the 21st anniversary to the day of the adoption of the Aarhus Convention. The invitation for tonight's event speaks of the network promoting and building collaboration between academics, activists, NGOs and decision makers. And it occurred to me that over the course of my career that Peter's just described, I've worked in all of these capacities at different times including, as Peter said, a stint with the UK government's Department for Environment 15 or so years ago. While much of what I'll say tonight may have particular resonance with the activist, NGO and legal communities, I'm conscious too of the perspective of government decision makers, and I'll try to touch on that perspective also. But since we're today celebrating the anniversary of the Aarhus Convention, I want to start by noting that activists NGOs and academics were, of course, at the heart of the Convention from the get-go. When the Convention was being negotiated, which took place over 10 one-week sessions between 1996 and 1998, an EU member state official said that the NGOs negotiated as if they were another country, quite a big country. A European Commission representative added that the NGOs had an enormous impact on the negotiations. And that's, of course, not always the case in international environmental agreements. The Aarhus Convention very much uh, an outlier in that sense. So NGOs and activists played a crucial role in shaping the text of the Aarhus Convention, and they have played and continue to play a crucial role in its implementation on the ground. But we, of course, face far greater and more looming environmental challenges today than we did when the Convention was adopted in 1998, which means that the most important work of activists, NGOs, and their lawyers is only just beginning. It's striking to me how much the environmental narrative has changed even in my own lifetime. During my school years in Scotland, when it came to fossil fuels, the problem relayed in my science classes was of fossil fuels running out, not of them causing catastrophic climate breakdown. And when it came to species extinctions, we learned about the dodo's extinction as some kind of a cautionary tale, as if we humans had learned our lesson once and for all in the 17th century. My classmates and I believed those comforting stories because that's what we were taught. And those stories and others like them gave us the excuse for a relatively carefree upbringing. All's changed now, of course. Today, a good day on my Twitter timeline involves scientists debating whether it's accurate to say we may all, we may all go extinct within the next 30 years. It's really not a happy place to be. In any event, as a result of the shared scientific understanding of our very serious predicament, leading to growing public alarm, governments are belatedly taking notice, at least on paper. So we now find ourselves, for example, in an official climate and biodiversity emergency, as Peter mentioned, though you wouldn't know it from the unhurried business as usual carrying on all around us. Given the scientific discourse, which increasingly seeps into the public consciousness directly via social media, and to a lesser extent via traditional media, it's no wonder that there's growing talk of climate and ecological grief and of related mental health issues arising even in the very young. I've been immersed in climate science for the past few years as a, as a result of my involvement in particular in uh, the, pace, the case Peter described called Climate Case Ireland. And two facts stay with me and stand out for me as particularly shocking. First is the World Health Organization's estimate that 250,000 people will die each year 
from 2030 to 2050 as a result of climate breakdown based on only a small selection of risks. That's a quarter of a million avoidable deaths each year based on a very conservative estimate, meaning that climate breakdown is clearly a here and now fundamental rights issue and not some sort of future generations problem. I see even today a report in the press of an imminent report from Philip Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, saying that the impacts of global heating are likely to undermine not only basic rights to life, water, food and housing for hundreds of millions of people, but also democracy and the rule of law itself. The second shocking fact that sticks in my mind is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's finding that coral reefs will decline by 70 to 90 percent with global heating of 1.5 degrees Celsius, and that virtually all, by which they mean greater than 99 percent of coral reefs, will be lost with 2 degrees Celsius of heating. Since we're projected to pass through both of these temperature thresholds long before the end of this century, unless we take immediate, very radical action, coral reefs will vanish altogether, and with them the intricate webs of life that took millions of years to evolve. Watching the film Finding Nemo, tomorrow's children may ask us wide-eyed, did these things really once exist? And we'll have to say, yes, yes they did, just like the dinosaurs. But it feels to me like we've reached a critical turning point when everything's up for grabs. And that's why the establishment of this network is both so important and so timely. As some of you will have seen, there's been a debate raging recently amongst environmental activists about whether NGOs and activists should focus on individual or systemic change seeking, uh, in seeking to address the climate and biodiversity crises. As far as I'm concerned, Greta Thunberg settled the debate earlier this week when she said, yes, I know we need system change rather than individual change, but we cannot have one without the other. Hearteningly, this past year has seen the emergence of global movements built on a foundation of individuals realizing that their actions are more powerful when exercised collectively, from Extinction Rebellion to the Green New Deal movement in the United States to the global climate strike movement led by Greta Thunberg. And if experience in Ireland teaches us anything, it's that individuals and NGOs can make a huge difference if they act strategically and use the law cleverly. Take Peter Sweetman, for example, who I see here tonight. Peter has single-handedly brought some of the most significant environmental cases in Ireland, including several before the Court of Justice of the European Union. And consider the small NGO Friends of the Irish Environment, uh, based in West Cork, with an annual turnover of less than €20,000. In the past two years, Friends of the Irish Environment has, via litigation, established via the Dublin Airport case a new constitutional right to an environment consistent with human dignity, the first unenumerated constitutional right established in Ireland in decades. It has challenged the Irish government's inaction on climate change via Climate Case Ireland, alleging that this inaction breaches human rights, constitutional rights and Ireland's Climate Act 2015. It has secured not one but two preliminary references to the Court of Justice of the EU in cases relating respectively to the Shannon LNG project and public access to litigation documents, which is, a, of course, an Aarhus Convention issue. It's also challenged the absence of legal aid for environmental cases in Ireland, another Aarhus Convention issue. And it's challenged Ireland's National Development Plan and the National Planning Framework, which together set out a long-term development strategy to 2040. And those are just a, a, a selection of their cases. There are others uh, ongoing. So these are just a few of the landmark strategic cases in which this small NGO is currently involved. All of them, apart from the Dublin Airport case that I mentioned first, are still ongoing. And a crucial factor in these cases has been collaboration between activists, NGOs, lawyers and academics. Just the sort of collaboration that the network being launched tonight will help to foster. Another crucial factor in the bringing of these cases has been the Aarhus Convention itself. And I'd like to turn now to an aspect of the Convention that seems particularly salient to me in the context of tonight's event. But before I do so, I'd like to say something to environmental decision makers in the audience tonight, which is this. Much of the remainder of what I will say tonight relates to the power and value of strategic litigation in advancing environmental justice. As a general matter, I feel this is a hugely underrepresented area of work for activists and NGOs for various reasons. 
That is to say, a lot of NGO work seems to focus on what could broadly be called advocacy, i.e. lobbying civil servants and ministers and so on. Much less time is devoted to litigation. The opportunity in this field for decision makers, it seems to me, is to head off the need for litigation altogether. First, by taking decisions that are consistent with existing legal obligations, of course, but second, in a less obvious sense, by creating institutional opportunities for participation and collaboration with NGOs and activists with a view to de-escalating environmental disputes before they get to the point of litigation. This might be an important avenue worth exploring further in the context of the network we're launching tonight. Now to the Aarhus Convention itself. The issue I'd like to focus on is access to justice and legal costs. It's undoubtedly the case that the Aarhus Convention's requirement that accessing justice in environmental matters must not be prohibitively expensive has transformed the possibilities for public interest litigation in Ireland. We now have a system of one-way cost shifting that has been painstakingly broadened in scope over the past few years via litigation and related legislative changes. But the overall effect is clear. Public interest litigants can now bring legal challenges in many areas of environmental law without facing potential bankruptcy. This is not to say that litigants don't have to be brave. They do, of course. But cases can be framed to fall insofar as possible within the cost protection rules. The result is that litigants in Ireland can often find lawyers who are willing to act on a conditional fee basis, no fall, no fee basis in important cases. And they can take those cases without being exposed to the costs of the opposing side if they lose. Applicants still face outlay costs, such as stamp duty, photocopying, and so on. And these costs can run to thousands of euro in a big case. But such costs can be planned for and raised in a way that is not true, typically at least, of the massive legal costs associated with a loser pays system. So the result is that the Aarhus Convention has greatly liberalized access to justice in environmental matters in Ireland. And the fact that a small number of brave, brave environmental litigants have stepped up to the mark as a result has served to fill the gap to some extent left by the European Commission's reduced enforcement activity since the financial crisis. What we've seen lately in response, unfortunately, has been a shift away from environmental democracy by the state, in response in particular to the legal challenge and subsequent abandonment by Apple of plans for a data centre in County Galway. The government has since announced plans to restrict future legal challenges by further narrowing the time window for launching actions for judicial review in certain cases, and by restricting the standing rules that provide access to the courts. While these developments are, of course, highly regrettable, any attack on basic rules of environmental democracy uh, are themselves likely to come under challenge, courtesy of the rights enshrined in the Aarhus Convention. And while I know that the cost rules and fee arrangements that can be reached with lawyers are different in Northern Ireland, it should nevertheless be possible to design and resource important cases in such a way so as to liberalise access to justice and tackle environmental injustices in a strategic way. Discussing these sorts of issues will be just one of the many benefits of the new network. Related to this access to justice issue, it's important to recognise that the space the Aarhus Convention has created for litigation can be utilised, at least to my mind, most effectively by strategic or systemic public interest litigation. Such litigation is important on its substance, but can also play an important exhortative role. By which I mean, while winning strategic cases is of course the aim, such cases can also serve, win or lose, as important vehicles for creating greater public awareness and debate. They can serve as focal points for diverse campaigners to coalesce around, and they can help to shift paradigms when the public imagination is captured by the symbolic or rhetorical significance of the litigation as Rogers puts it. That was certainly our experience with Climate Case Ireland, a case that was heard by the High Court in Dublin in January, and which played, I think, a small <clears throat> but important role in beginning to change the public conversation around climate action in Ireland. We certainly had a sense that something unusual and notable was afoot when the courtroom was packed over the four days of the hearing. Normally, as you'll know, environmental cases are pretty poorly attended, but a broad cross-section of life was packed into that courtroom. Indeed, over 100 people in a 30-seater court, from babies and toddlers through school children to the elderly. It was genuinely inspiring and at times moving to see these fundamental rights issues, including the right to life, the right to family life and home and so on, being aired and argued in front of all, young and old, 
in a courtroom so full that the judge had to stop proceedings at one point to direct members of the public to floor space down beside his bench. As one politician commented on Twitter on the final afternoon of the hearing, I have never seen anything like it. Babies and toddlers, young and old, spread politely on the court floor, wrapped in attention to the proceedings. It would make you proud of our republic. One of the most important roles of the network established here tonight, to my mind, will be to discuss and to frame the possibilities for pursuing environmental justice strategically going forward. Jeffrey Sachs, director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University and a UN special advisor, has urged citizens to pursue major polluters and negligent governments and to flood the courts, his words, with legal cases demanding the right to a safe and clean environment. This work has never been more vital and there is no time to lose. While this message might be a hard one for some environmental decision makers to hear, I'm a fan of Bob Dylan's maxim, let us not talk falsely now, the hour is getting late. And let us not forget that we are, in a literal sense, all in this together, all breathing the same 415 parts per million air. In conclusion then, it seems to me that the Environmental Justice Network Ireland looks set to play a vital contribution to the public discourse around urgent, ambitious environmental action and at just the right time. How successfully it fulfills this role will be up to all of us here, of course, and others who join us. And this brings us back to the question of individual action. For me, both as an activist and as a lawyer pursuing, envi uh, and as a lawyer, pursuing environmental justice via litigation if necessary provides a satisfying answer to the question, what's the best thing I can do now? To take the example of Climate Case Ireland, the case arose not because those involved were the only people who could bring the case. It arose because they were the only people who did bring the case. Now that might sound trite, but it contains an important truth. I clearly remember in 2017 discussing the possibility of a strategic climate case in Ireland with John Kenny, who was ultimately junior counsel in the case. And we reached the conclusion, well, someone has to do this. And we looked around us and we thought, in the absence of anyone else doing it, well, then we have to do it. And while it felt like we had a mountain to climb, I must say it was liberating sitting down in front of a blank computer screen with a blinking cursor and beginning to type the outline of the case. Because until someone does that, there is no case and there is no possibility of environmental justice. As the economist Kate Raworth puts it, and I'm paraphrasing, the most powerful tool in law is a pencil, because with a pencil you can redraw the world. I look forward to working with you and the Environmental Justice Network Ireland in its vital work, and I'd ask you to please join me in thanking Kira, Peter, Dean and James for bringing the network into existence. Thank you.